in your programs, if we can make one adjustment, it says under my name, assistant professor. If you could erase assistant and change that to associate, I would greatly appreciate that. That was my moment of shameless self-promotion. Thank you. Thank you for, for egging me on with that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm so glad to see a nice group here. We want to talk today about pop culture in the classroom and the ways that we can use pop culture and the ways why we're going to use it. And I'm going to talk a lot about my experiences in the classroom and why I use it and the successes that I've had from that. And I hope at times we can talk about some of your experiences too. But I think that one of the first things that we need to do is talk about what it is. And there's a very obvious definition of what pop culture is. But I went and I did research. So you didn't have to. I looked this up. I went to dictionary.com. I went to Wikipedia, which is ridiculously detailed about this topic. And, and the main definition I got was this top one. Mass media driven activities, entertainments, commercial artifacts, etc., aimed at the interest of the general populace. So one of the main things that we're looking at here is mass media driven activities. Now, a lot of the definitions I found want to say that it's generally that which is going to appeal to younger people. And that makes sense, right? Because younger people, the 18 to 34 demographic, they're the ones that dictate every direction that we're going. But I don't think that's a necessary inclusion for us, although it might be a given to a degree. Cultural cachet might be more likely to be given something that's appealing to younger people, a popular meme or a YouTube clip. But I think other pop culture matters too. Two O's on two, but still, either way. Um, so what I'm saying with this is that when it comes to popular culture, if it's something that matters to you, then it's going to potentially matter to the, the student. Maybe not directly. Maybe they're not going to run off and, and listen to your Sticks album after class is over. But, but I think that if we can make things appealing and make things engaging, then it's possible to make those things engaging for the student too. In the same way that it's important for them to be able to feel comfortable with the types of pop culture that they're going to have presented as well. So the question is, why does this matter? Why is it important to talk about this idea of popular culture? We all like things, right? We probably like things that we could fit into that definition of stuff that a lot of people like. Even if we're really super cool, there's probably a few things that we like that we have to admit that others like too. Um, so what does it matter? We like stuff, they like stuff. So what? We got it. Because knowing what our students care about and using it to help them comprehend the material will help them to be more engaged. It's going to help them become more engaged. There have been a lot of great panels that I've got to, to observe today. We've talked about trying to find ways to have our students get on our side and have our students become interested in what we're saying, ways we do that. And, and I think pop culture is a really, really good one. And I use it in a variety of ways. And so I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about small and big ways that I use pop culture in my classroom. And one thing that I do is I begin every class with a question. Uh, it's a role question. I made that sound more dramatic than it probably is. Um, it's not like, you know, is there a god? It's like, who's your favorite superhero? Um, so I begin every class with a question, like an icebreaker question, and I take role. So instead of saying here, they have to answer the question, unless the answer to their question happens to be here, which hasn't happened yet. So my questions are things like, you know, what's your favorite movie? Who's your favorite superhero? If you had a superpower, what would it be? I used to ask, what crazy celebrity would you most like to see as president? I changed that one. I took that out. It didn't, it didn't resonate quite the same way that I intended to originally. Um, but I like to have these questions because they start things off. And they do a couple of things. One thing they do is they make students talk. Whether that student wants to talk or not, they have to answer the question. And it's something that is engaging. And so it's something that they're going to want to answer. And another thing it does is it allows them to talk about something that they probably have pretty good control over. Um, so if I ask, and I, the first one I ask is, What's your favorite movie? And sometimes I'll get students who will say, well, I don't know, because I love every movie, which I'm very skeptical of. Um, but they'll, they'll start to kind of go through their own pop culture knowledge. And a couple of things start to happen with this. One thing is that the student takes ownership, and they have something that they talk about. They get to name their movie that they really like. Then others get to respond to it, too. And I'll have a student say a movie, and then someone else will say, oh, yeah, that's a great movie. And I'll say, does, does it feel good when someone else reinforces your film? Because when I say my film, nobody seems to be that excited about it. So it's like a way of the, the group becoming a community, which is really important, right? And so this is an easy way to start to build that community, to start to build it through shared interests. And, and another thing that I, well, we'll talk about that one later. But, so this is the way we get started, is we start on, on equal ground. That's one thing we do. And so you, we, we care about stuff too. It might not be the same stuff as our students, though sometimes it most definitely is, but that's all right. 
having specific pop culture touchstones and knowing how to use them, regardless of what they are, will engage our students. And that's something that we're going to talk a lot about here, is that it doesn't necessarily matter if they're things that our students are going to immediately connect with, because we could probably make them connect with it through our own personal passion for those things. Now, I want to just do one more definition to, to clarify what pop culture is. So when we look at pop culture, we could look at it as stuff that appeals to young, younger audience. We could look at stuff that appeals to us. We could look at pop culture from previous generations that we could still relate to what's going on here. So if what your pop culture interest is is watching lots of MASH, maybe our students aren't doing that these days. Maybe they are. I don't know. Um, but if you wanted to use a particular episode, that will work. So I don't even necessarily think it has to be something that's contemporary. It could still be something that worked. I remember talking to a colleague of mine who was really interested in 70s rock. And he would use a lot of references to 70s rock in his classroom. The students might not necessarily have been there to start with, but maybe they're there by the end. And if they're not there, maybe they're closer to there. Um, and so having our passions come across is going to be really beneficial to getting these, stuff, these things across. So when we talk about pop culture, it's, it's an opposite to high culture. So we could talk about J.K. Rowling. And in my classes, we do. Oh, we do. We spend so much time talking about what Hogwarts house we would be in. Um, and it's a weird moment when you realize that you're so obviously Hufflepuff. And, and you have to come to terms with that. Uh, but I embrace it. My students talk about that. And then when I have fellow Hufflepuff in the classroom, we're, we're good. We, we, we connect. We bond. It's because of pop culture. So J.K. Rowling is good. T.S. Eliot, maybe not what I'm talking about. Um, but when we can make those connections so that we can make T.S. Eliot accessible, that's great. But I'm not necessarily looking at that. And what I'm going to talk about mostly are my experiences in 1010 and 2010 English classes. I, I think that it's easier to incorporate these things in English classes because they have, so much, they have so much control over what they write about. I'm fascinated to find out how these types of things could work in other classes, too. Uh, but let's start by talking about, about the things that we can do. So the, the first thing I want to talk about is pop culture as a way of humanizing yourself in the classroom, to make yourself a more accessible person. Have you seen my shoes? Have you seen my shoes? My shoes are pretty cool, right? Can you, can you catch them? It might be tricky. I don't know if I can handle this the entire way. You're all the way back. My classes are generally smaller than this. Uh, what, what are my shoes? Can you describe my shoes? Random person who I've never seen a Star Wars movie with? They're Star Wars shoes. Right, they're Star Wars shoes. Um, I will wear these shoes occasionally. I don't want to, you can't wear these shoes every day. You become that guy really, really quickly. Um, but I have shoes, I have my pair of bands with Star Wars all over them. Um, on Fridays, I wear a pop culture shirt that'll have some pop culture entity that I like. Um, on the USU Eastern campus, we were told to wear um, USU Eastern gear on Fridays. I respectfully decline. I already had, I already had my thing. So, so they couldn't take my thing. Um, so I have these shirts that will have Doctor Who or Star Wars or Star Trek or, or things that I care about, things that I'm interested in. And they work really well as conversation starters. They become accessible um, for my students. My office is, uh, a, Melanie, what do I call it? Do I call it a mess? I can call it a mess, right? There's too much eager nodding from my colleagues in the back of the room. <laughs> my office isn't perhaps the most organized place on the USU Eastern campus, but it's got personality. Uh, <laughs> It's got Doctor Who posters. I've got a poster of the Rat Pack up on the wall. I've got things that are conversation starters throughout the room. I want my students to feel comfortable when they come into my office. When I was an undergraduate, I once went into a romantic professor's office, and he was listening to classical music so loudly, I could not actually hear myself think when I walked into his room, and he did not make eye contact with me for the entirety of our conversation. It's weird. <laughs> And, and I walked out of that thinking, I don't know if I'm ever going to teach someday, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> and, and so I make sure that my spaces on campus, and me as a person, are approachable. And I use pop culture as a way to do that because this is stuff that I like, um, that I can engage in a conversation with these things. And I do because I care about them so much. So I start off with pop culture as a way of humanizing me in the classroom. It's also a way of accessibility, as we've already talked about. Um, this works for the papers that I assign also. Um, I, I leave it open on a lot of my project assignments in 1010 and 2010. And I have a couple that really ease into pop culture in a pretty easy and elegant way. Uh, for example, one project I do in 2010 is an evaluation. I ask them to evaluate something. And usually what they choose to do is to evaluate a film, a TV show, maybe a, 
um, music or an album, something like that. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they evaluate a law or rule. That's fine. But a lot of students, they are able to take this ownership by getting into something. And just last semester, I had a student who evaluated a rap album that I had not listened to. Um, and, and so I listened to the whole thing. When my daughter got up in the morning, I had to turn it off fairly quickly. Um, perhaps this was not the, the wiggles. Um, but it was a way for her to show me something that she's interested in and to get to write about. She was really enthusiastic about it. She really loved it. And it was a way for me to kind of have this connection with a student. Now, I didn't listen to the whole thing. I didn't get out of it what she did. But I wanted to take that time because she was sharing something with me. And so I want to use these as opportunities for these students to take ownership of the material by using popular culture as a way to get that across. Um, another paper that I use is uh, it's an uh, analysis project that I do in 1010 where I ask them to evaluate a, and analyze a commercial. So they have to take a 30 second or longer ad and analyze it. And this ends up being a real important pop culture element too because they'll often do movie trailers, they'll do video game ads, they'll do things that really matter to them. They'll take sports figures, pop culture figures. I look at all of this as being pop culture type um, elements. And so these are things that they start to get more excited about because they're not just analyzing a poem that they're having trouble accessing. Um, I'll be able to help them access that as we go on, but this is a way of getting them to take immediate ownership and excitement about a project. Um, I teach a research paper. In 1010, it's a research paper where we choose a decade as a class and they have to pick something from that decade. Um, and very often, I will have students writing about things that feel like they fit into this definition of pop culture. Um, if we're talking about um, the 20s, I had a student write about the history of Oreos. In the 40s, I had a student write about the history of M&Ms and how they connected to World War II. It was fascinating. Um, I learned so much more about M&Ms than I ever thought I would, and so did the student. And so it was a way of taking something that was a pop culture interest, a, a, a junk food interest of the student, and turning it into something that allowed us to move forward with the conversation. And so, so it's helping us with accessibility. It's helping us with investment. Um, it's allowing students to write on video game reviews. They don't necessarily always get to do that. And sometimes students get really excited about this. Sometimes they get so into this, I have any idea what the hell they're talking about. Um, but that's okay, because they're, they're going to convince me of what it means to be. I had a student in a creative writing class. Now, I, I often share my work with students, or they find it, um, if, if I'm lucky enough for them to take that initiative. And I write about a lot of pop culture things on, on my own work. So a lot of my poems are about pop culture things. So it allows students to feel comfortable when they get into that too. And I had one student several semesters ago who wrote, <clears throat> and I'm not making this up, it, it warmed my heart that he did this, five-page poem on Sonic the Hedgehog. This is like, as a, as a teacher, as a student, as, as a guy who played a lot of video games in the 90s, uh, this was amazing. Um, and it was one of the most detailed <laughs> things that I've ever read. And this is a student who, who had Asperger's. This is a student who had a lot of trouble communicating in class. And this opus really helped open him up to the class and to the class to open up to him. Now, a lot of the class was confused by what was going on, because perhaps they did not have the same knowledge of the Sonic the Hedgehog universe that I did. Um, but I was the right guy to help this student. And I think by that point in the semester, he knew it. And so that, that uh, trust came into play in an important way, too. And, and here's one that is a use for pop culture that I think is really timely and really important. Um, there's a lot of polarizing things happening in the world. I don't know if you've kept up with the news, uh, which I also, honestly, I felt after watching the news yesterday, it's like, why am I talking about pop culture? Let's talk about this, but we can't if you want to. Um, but I, I think that it's really sometimes hard for students, especially some of our students, they're reserved. They're learning how to be college students in a 1010 or a 2010 classroom. They, do, they don't feel confident in having some of these discussions. So it's difficult for them to, to know how to approach a topic. So if I just came in and addressed the class and said, let's talk about gender inequality and pay, I'm going to get a lot of people who are either not going to want to talk about that, because that sounds hard, um, or I'm going to get a lot of potential like angry personal issues that I don't necessarily want to get. So what I could do instead is Let's talk about this. What are the top two grossing films of 2017? You know what they are? Wonder Woman is one of them. What's number one? No. No, that would not fit into my, my thesis here. Um, number one. My daughter really loved it. She's fine. Beauty and the Beast. 
Beauty and the Beast and Wonder Woman are the top two grossing films of 2017. What do they have in common? Female leads. They both have female leads. So, what if I introduce this as a question? Shouldn't the, the lead actress in Wonder Woman, Gail Goodell, shouldn't she make more money than Ben Affleck? I mean, her movie was a whole lot more successful than what he's done. Um, shouldn't it? This, this gets us into a different discussion, right? It gets us into a discussion of specifics, but it's also getting into a discussion of um, pop culture. And that's where it starts. It's not going to end there. Um, but it might be an easier way for students to kind of get invested in the types of discussions that we're going to have. So I, I think that looking at it from that perspective, too, I think the previous year, the, a, a lot of the top movies over the last few years have had female leads. Um, this is interesting, because we're supposed to be surprised every time it happens. Yet, I think the year before, um, Rogue One was, was the, the top movie of the year. That has a female lead. Um, so these things are happening. This is the kind of conversation that we can have in the classroom in a way that isn't making it so aggressively about certain topics. And, and I think it's fascinating to be able to get into these things and talk about this stuff. Now, now for me, I, I love having these pop culture discussions with students. I have my own personal lapses. There's some things that I don't know about as much as I'd like. Um, I, I've had to admit to a few friends this weekend of, of some serious recent pop culture lapses in my life. <sighs> Game of Thrones, guys. I'm sorry. I've had trouble. I've started a few times. I can't get there. Um, I've never seen a Fast and the Furious movie. I'm less worried about that one. That, that seems OK. Um, but I will have students that will speak passionately about these things. Uh, Walking Dead is another one. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get into it. But I'll have students that are really, really excited about this stuff. And so I make sure that, we, that I, I know enough to get by. I always pride myself on that, um, that I know enough to get by. That I, I know a lot about the show Lost, but I also knew that if I didn't know enough about the show Lost from a few years ago, if I just said, isn't that island full of mysteries, I could get by. <laughs> right? And so, so I could do that. I know enough on Game of Thrones, so I could get by. Um, and so these things end up being really important for me to just have enough investment for the students to be able to push it the rest of the way. Um, I was talking a bit about pop culture interests that the students are not immediately going to be excited about. I can talk about Doctor Who, and I will have a couple of students that will be really excited, and suddenly I'll be their favorite, and the rest of them will wonder what is wrong with us, and that's okay. And I'll find another way to get to them. Um, and, and I can do that. But then there are other things that I like to do that aren't going to immediately work. Like, I, there's a singer that I like, Josh Ritter. Love Josh Ritter. He's a terrific singer-songwriter. If you don't know him, he's worth looking up. You're not going to do that, but that's okay. Um, my students don't know him. They didn't know who he was. But I thought that this would be a really good way of teaching them about how to analyze something. So I could have taken a poem, but I didn't. I took this song. Um, and so I brought a song into them, and we talked about the lyrics. It was before we listened to it, but we talked about the lyrics, and we broke the lyrics down. And then we listened to it as a class. It benefited them that they didn't know what it was beforehand, because they were able to make up their own minds on, on where this was. And it was something that I cared deeply about, and that helped propel that conversation about it. So that was an important way of getting me involved in that. Um, and then there are lots of things that I have presented about and talked about. It was mentioned earlier that I've presented at numerous pop culture conferences. Uh, here are the conversation topics that I've had when I've, when I've presented at pop culture conferences around the country. I talked about Shakespearean influence in Lost. Um, and I told this group of students that I was presenting on the, the TV show Lost. This is when it was still on. Well, I guess when it had just finished. And a student came up to me and said, can you explain the ending to me? And I said, no. No, I really can't. Um, but we could talk about the show. You want to talk about Shakespeare and Lost? No, not really. Um, but, but this was a way, again, students get really interested in this. If I talk about some of the other research I'm doing, pedagogical research, I'm not going to have a student come up to me after class and ask me what I'm doing. But they'll do it here. Um, so I presented about that once. I presented a conference about how to use the Avengers movies in the creative writing classroom and how I could take clips from the Avengers and talk about m popular movies that my students have assuredly seen and be able to use it that way. I talked about that once. I talked about what a terrible school Hogwarts is. This was a controversial topic, because I have groups of students who spent their entire lives wishing they could go to Hogwarts. Frankly, I, I think they put their students in danger <laughs> more than I'm comfortable <laughs> with. I, I don't do that at all. There are very, very few times that I would do that to my students. And, and so we talk about that. And I had a student who came up to me um, a couple days after I told him what I was working on, and we chatted a little bit about class. And she said, you know, my sister and I stayed up the entire night defending Hogwarts. And I said, that's the best thing I've heard. And so we got to have a conversation, and she didn't know it. 
but this is a homeschooled student. This is a student who I've had a lot of conversations with about creative writing. She went into a deep pedagogical defense of what Hogwarts does. And it was really exciting because she did all this brilliant thinking with her sister and had no idea she was doing it. I didn't burst the bubble, but dragging that up too much. But, um, but these are the types of things that I've talked about um, in, in, in my presentations. And I always make sure that I talk to my students about them too. I want them to feel invested in what I'm doing. And in that Harry Potter discussion, my gosh, they gave me really good ideas that I totally gave them credit for when I later presented at that conference. I did. And, and so these are, these are ways that I can incorporate this. Now, I teach English, and it's probably easier for me to, to use some of these things in the classroom. But I was just talking to a colleague of mine who was not able to make it to this panel, but she teaches math. And math seems like one that'd be harder to incorporate some of these things, although nothing's ever impossible. But what she does is she does a math project each semester in which she incorporates like students to, to take a topic and a project and write about it and explore it. And so she'll have all these different um, artifacts that are set up around our, one of our student lounges on campus filled with students who've used math to tell stories. And this is a perfect opportunity for this. And that one student that I was mentioning who was convinced Hogwarts is a great school, talk to me later. It's not. <laughs> she, she wrote about cre specific ways that you could use math when composing creative writing. So she used her interest in young adult novels and math to help tell a story. Now, I didn't understand fully the story because there's a reason I teach English and not math. But these were ways of taking math and incorporating popular culture elements into it. And I think it can work in a lot of different capacities. And like I said, I'm really interested in the ways that we can do that, the ways that you have thought about this. So I'm wondering what the best approach would be. Do you guys want to kind of talk amongst yourselves for a few minutes and talk about ways that you think about things that you like and how you can make them work in the classroom, or even things you've done before. Or do some people have things they want to talk to me about right now um, that they can get into? What do you think? I, I'm done with PowerPoints, because I just want, I want this to be organic. What do you got? I'll, I'll repeat back so, so everybody in the back can hear. So she's using German songs to teach um, grammar, to teach language, to teach culture and history and things like that, too. How does that work? Do they get more out of it? Well, I teach lower levels here, so it doesn't work as well. Okay. I teach higher levels, there's um, no more German, it works better. Sure. Nothing works as well in the lower levels. Yeah. Sometimes does it. So it works better maybe in some of the more advanced levels and not in the others. How do students react to you when you take the guitar? Do you, do you use a guitar or anything? No. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. So we just do YouTube. So you're not presenting in class. Okay. No. I, I love it too because I introduce them to German audiences. Excellent. They, you know, some students don't understand German and they don't understand German and they don't know about musicians. They don't know about So it's, so, so it's perfect. So it's introducing the students to German artists. So it's actually a way of directly bringing pop culture into the classroom. And it's a pop culture that they're not as aware of as others. That's really awesome. Fantastic. Hi. Okay. I'm sure you do more than that, than just show movies, but, but you show a lot of movies. <laughs> so you've got it figured out. That's great. My personal favorite is when you Okay. Okay, so using a lot of, of film and then having conversation that comes from the film. Um, and Wag the Dog, that's the one about the, the president who fakes a war in order to distract from his own problems at home. Never happened. We'll do that legit these days, won't we? Um, yes, in the blue. Um, so I teach English as a foreign language. Okay. And I taught in China for years. So I actually use Chinese like, different words and phrases that I use in the Chinese because not only are they getting the English aspect of the language through grammar, sure. but they're also able to watch it in the native language because I was teaching them English. Excellent. So I would say one example I told them was that for the lesson on Excellent. Okay. 
<laughs> you can use a lot of examples from literature to describe the word orphan, that's for sure. Um, so this is great. So using examples from film to help teach students about language and culture and the word forehead. This is good. This is excellent. Um, yes? So I teach a nursing course. We talk about nutrition and So, so in this case, using Parks and Rec, using a show that makes commentary on what's going on in the public, but does it in a really funny and amusing way. So like it's, it's something that students could f learn from without even realizing they're learning anything from it. Um, I had a student, a couple of students once told me that they sat at their distance site and thought of me as Chris Traeger, <laughs> um, uh, which is Rob Lowe on the show, <laughs> which I get it, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm quite as high energy as that character, but you know, if I had a dime for every time somebody told me that I was reminding them of Rob Lowe, I'd have a dime. Um, yes, go ahead. How do they respond to it? How do they respond to, to Archie Bunker? It, are they laughing at the right things? You know what I mean? Because I, I went and saw Gran Torino several years ago in Price. Remember this one? This is the Clint Eastwood movie, the get off my lawn thing. Um, and, and the people in the, the, the audience were laughing hysterically at the racial slurs that he was throwing out. And my wife and I were sitting slightly uncomfortable about the room that we were in. So I'm curious on something like that. When I watch Archie Bunker, I, I, and all the family don't know how to respond fully. So I'm wondering how you, do you help with that or you just let it go? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it, it is astounding, that's for sure. Got a couple more minutes for questions, yes. If I can inspire one thing, one, if, if I can have inspired one person to do something, it would be that today. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, let me know what you find. And how many people are willing to, to be up front about being Hufflepuff, I think. Uh, yes. Okay. So, so they have to post a meme that sort of they think represents them or something? Sure. And, and you know, in moments like that, when I don't get a pop culture reference, you know, in the case you're talking about that there was an Iron Man reference, the class got it, I didn't, you own it, right? Um, and, and it's okay, you know, I, I am of a certain age, and I've come to admit that at times. And, and so there are things that I'm not going to get. And, and that's okay, the students will find it endearing if, if you don't pretend <laughs> you know something you don't. Uh, what else? Anybody else have anything that they're sharing? Yeah. Okay. Good. what we do. <laughs> that, that, that's really cool. Taking stuff that they've grown up with, taking pop culture totems and then analyzing them. It's, sometimes it's painful when we do that, um, but it really does end up teaching them things in a way that they might not have necessarily gotten. They're going to be more interested to start. Maybe you've crushed their dreams, but if you've taught them something, it's okay. 
Um, we have enough time for maybe one more, two more questions. Um, yes, or comments? That's, well, and it, it, that's got to be true in so many different fields. Um, that, that students, sure, although if you tell an archaeologist um, stuff about Indiana Jones, they don't seem to like it much. I don't know what's <laughs> up with that. I would think they'd take that as a massive compliment, but I hear things like grave robber, which seems really mean. Um, but that idea of students having these points of entry into the fields that we look at and, and helping them kind of own that. Now, obviously, you know, there are probably flaws. In, in some of those films you've mentioned that you're not going to talk in the classroom. But it's kind of interesting to be able to use those things that they might know and talk about what's working and what isn't. Um, and that ends up being pretty interesting. And there aren't a whole lot of movies about poetry, and those that are, I usually get concerned with. Dead Poet Society, he's not a good teacher, guys. He, be, he becomes far too invested, and he destroys those textbooks. We shouldn't do that. Uh, I think we're just about out of time. Um, thank you guys so much uh, for this. This was really fun, and I hope helpful. Thank you.